that is our call to prayer. We have two special prayer requests this morning, and if you want to begin to gather here at the front before we open our service in prayer, please feel free now. We want to pray for the Beck family, George and Alice. Alice's mother was uh, admitted into hospice just yesterday and uh, is expected two or three days. So you please pray for Alice especially, but for George as well. And then for David and Tanya Lyles, there are BBF missionaries to Peru and have been for 22 years. They graduated from BBC's missions course, but four years apart as they waited for each other. David, his parents are BBF missionaries, uh, Ken and Carrie Lyles, and Tanya, her parents are also missionaries to Peru. They have two daughters and a son. So we want to pray for the Becht family, and David and Tanya Lyles are missionaries to Peru, as well as this morning's service. So as you gather down here in front, or right where you're seated, we'll open the service in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your peace, your presence, the promise of your, not only your blessings, but your working in us and through us and for us, and that you have told us that where two or three or more are gathered in your name, there you are. And Father, we know that you are here in a way that we can't totally comprehend, but we accept it by faith and ask that you be glorified through all that is said and done in today's service that through the singing we'll lift our voices in true, sincere, genuine praise and worship. When we pray, we'll pray with faith. When we study your word, we'll open our hearts to the truth contained in it. And may there be glory in the church today because of your presence. And we ask you to bless this time of prayer. And to bless each person who came this morning. But we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. As you return to your seats, let me give you a few brief announcements so we can begin the worship service and go straight through into the sermon. First of all, on Wednesday nights, we have our three-pronged, uh, four-pronged program. Awanas is over in the gym. I got a picture of those in the loft so you could see all the young adults that meet with me upstairs. In the next couple of weeks, we'll have pictures of the gospel and life group down here. There were some 18 men in this small group, and there were 17 women in the small group outside as they did um, the armor of God, and that's available every Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. I hope you'll join us there. I also got a picture of the group we took to rock the universe. We had 28 teenagers go and six adults. We had a fantastic, exhausting time. In case you didn't realize, at 1 o'clock in the morning, it's just as hot as it is at noontime. It, it didn't drop one degree, it didn't seem like, at 1 o'clock in the morning, but we had a wonderful time, and thank you for helping make that possible. The teens uh, really enjoyed it. Also, the piano player, our new worship leader, Josh Ewing, is the brand new father of a brand new little baby girl, Aubrey Ann, was born just a couple of days ago. Let me congratulate uh, the, the Ewing family on that. And then next Sunday, if you keep, uh, keep in prayer, Stephen Ditchfield, he's scheduled to preach for us next Sunday. He had eye surgery a couple of weeks ago. It went very well. He's progressing fine, but pray for him and for the Sunday, Sunday service next week. And now would you please stand as we continue in worship and we sing the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and Righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank you. 
Aren't you glad for his forgiveness this morning? Amen. All right, at this time, we're going to dismiss the children. So if you want to follow Chuck and Amy Denny, they will lead the way. You're, di you're dismissed. you to follow along uh, with the scripture reading. It's going to be out of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. It says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
says, in all I do, I honor you. And every day, this should be our prayer, that in everything that we do, that we honor the Lord Jesus. Whether we're at work, whether we're uh, watching our kids, whether we're making dinner, whatever we do, we want to honor the Lord. And so I want to invite the ushers forward for our offering, and in this spirit of honoring him in all that we do, we want to honor him in giving. We've been singing about his amazing love and, and, the, and the power of the cross and his forgiveness. And God has given us so much. He's given us so much in the Lord Jesus and he's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. And we just, he's just asking really for just a little bit. I mean, he wants our whole life, but in the area of, of, of giving, he just wants just a little bit, and so we want to just honor him in that this morning. 
we know that he'll bless in what we give. So let's pray for this offering. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity to honor you in our giving. We ask that you would take this offering, that you would use it for your kingdom, you would use it for your purposes. Lord, that you would take what we give and just multiply it and just uh, for your kingdom, for, for the sake of the gospel, that what we give this morning would uh, go far and that it would honor your son and that you would be glorified and you would be lifted up and that you would use these resources to bring many into the kingdom. And so we thank you that we get to give because you've given so much to us. And we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, what beautiful music today, and what a wonderful reminder those songs were, and I hope that as you were singing them, you were reflecting on the words themselves, and, and not just the sound, but the words, and what the real message was, and I hope it rang true in your heart, and thank you for Josh being here, even though he's probably still asleep in his mind, recovering from the birth of little Aubrey Ann. Today we're talking about the resilience of the early church. It's one of the traits that I ad admire most, and it's a trait I thought I used to have. When I was young, I uh, had a lot of stamina. Uh, you might, maybe that close to being hyperactive, I think you could say. Maybe ADD, but I had a lot of energy, and I could run sprints all day long. And whatever sport it was we were playing, I could do the entire day of practice and then end the practice full energy, but I couldn't run long term. If it was longer than 100, 200 yards, something bad would happen to my body. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't find out until college that I had asthma. When I was having a physical done and the doctor asked me, what do you take for your asthma? And I said, I don't have asthma. I thought everybody had that burning sensation in your chest and you can't breathe after 200 yards. So I really admired two guys on my track team. They were two of the nation's best milers and we had them both on our track team. So we had the nation's best um, four-mile uh, relay. And I used to watch them run, and they could run the 60, uh, the 440-yard dash in the same time that I could, and they could do it again and again and again. And uh, they just were amazing to watch. And I remember thinking of all the sports I played, I would sit back and watch these two guys. They had long hair down past their shoulder because it was the 70s, and they were, they were modeling themselves after Steve Prefontaine. And they would run, and I thought, oh, to have that kind of stamina. Well, one day at a track meet, I was, uh, I was finished for the day, and I was talking to a girl that I sort of had a crush on at the base of the stands. When the coach comes and says, David, we need you. So I walked over to him and said, what do you need? He says, well, the anchor for the uh, mile relay just got hurt, and you're about the fourth fastest in the 440, so we need you to run the anchor. Now, I had never run. 440 yards without stopping. I didn't know what that experience was. He said, don't worry about it. We'll put you at the anchor. By the time you get the baton, you're going to be 100 yards ahead. Just coast through it, and we'll, we'll win the race. So I walked back to the uh, girl I was talking to. Well, I think I'm going to have to anchor the mile relay for the team here, so uh, I won't be able to see you until after the, the match. I get over in line, and you stand up in a mile relay, you run a circle, and then a circle, and a circle, and a circle. So you're all four standing together. So I'm sizing up the other guys and seeing who the anchor is. Well, there was a guy about nine feet, seven inches tall on one of the teams. And I thought, oh, no, I bet you he's fast. So we take off. Sure enough, our first guy comes around, and he gives us a really good lead. The second guy comes around, and we're even in a bigger lead. The third guy takes off, and so now I'm on the inside because we're in the lead, and the first, I'll be the first one to get the baton out of the four teams that are there. Our guy gets around the corner, his knee kicks the baton, and he drops the baton. By the time he picks up the baton, the other three teams have caught up. So now it's a race, and all of them are running around the backside, and so now we're shifting to move to see who gets the baton. Now I'm going to get the baton last. Now, I have never run a 440, and I hated losing, and I wasn't about to lose. So he takes the baton, he takes the baton, he takes the baton, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. I get the baton about 20 yards short of everybody else. I take off, and I go full speed, not knowing what is waiting for me. I get around the first curve, and I catch him on the first curve, because I could run 100 yards real fast. I catch him on the curve, and I hear the crowd go, they're, they're yelling and screaming. They've never seen anybody pass somebody on the curve because you're not supposed to do it. You're supposed to pass on the straight way because when you pass on a curve, you're adding yardage to the thing. I didn't know that either. So I'm passing on the curve, and I'm running past them, and we get to the back straightaway, and the crowd is standing up there cheering, and they're hollering, and I turn to look, and I remember this image I saw. The guy that was 9 feet 7, as he was running next to me, as he was jumping up, I could see the crowd through his legs. I went, mean, I mean, wow, that guy's tall. So I just kept on running. I go the back 110 yards, and I'm on the curve, the last curve coming around the corner, and my body starts to tighten up. They call it lactic acid buildup. I call it death. 
because it was about that close. I came around that last curve, and my body's starting to tighten up. I get on the straightaway. I'm 50 yards from the finish line, and I hear this. <laughs> now, that's that guy's. That's his le legs. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going as fast as I can trying to get to the finish line. I'm about 10 yards from the finish line, and he, <laughs> and he goes right past me. I come in second, and I'm stuck. I can't move. Well, my team, they're cheering. They didn't care about uh, winning or losing. They just loved watching me turn into a statue. Because I was, my legs got further and further apart. My shoulders got higher up, and I'm running like this. And I get to the finish line, and I stop, and I can't move. My muscles had become like solid rock. So they come. They pick me up, took me into the uh, infield, took off my shoes, tried to get me to relax, and I couldn't. And it was the most horrible experience I've ever had in athletics. But it showed me you don't have any stamina. You can't run 440 yards without having an out-of-the-body experience. And ever since then, I would watch those two guys run and how they could run forever. And I'd, I'd admire flash in the pans are neat. Speed is cool. But somebody who can just keep going and going like the Energizer Bunny. I really admire stamina. Well, the church, early church, had stamina. They had resilience. They had persistence. They had all those terms we're going to get to in just a moment. But it extended from the Lord's command to them when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And if you look at that term, gates of hell and prevail, it could be both offensive and defensive, but it doesn't really matter for this point. It means that the church is going to face opposition and it's going to be attacked but it will survive. And because it will survive, it survives based upon something important, the perseverance of the early church. Perseverance means steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Synonyms are tenacity, persistence, determination, stamina, endurance, obstinacy, and resilience. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness, the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape, elasticity. Resilience, perseverance, whatever word you might want to use to describe the church. They had the will to do good, and they had the will to refrain from doing bad, regardless of the odds and regardless of the immediate outcome. The famous preacher Henry Ward Beecher said this, the difference between perseverance and obstinacy is that one requires a strong will and the other requires a strong won't. The church's goal is like Paul's. It's to run the race, finish the course, and keep the faith. I saw in a quote this week that the greatest oak was once just a little nut that held his ground. So the, the church that is alive today once was 12 people. Then was people in an upper room, and then it was Pentecost, and then it exploded in growth, all while facing persecution. So my first point I want us to consider today is the early church learned the true foundation of joy. They didn't just persevere in misery, they persevered joyfully. They had learned what Jesus said to them when he sent the 70 out, and they came back, and they said, Lord, while we were out there, we were able to cast out demons. And Jesus said to them, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So he gave them a foundational truth right at the start. Don't rejoice in how things play out. Don't rejoice if things are good or if you have power. Let the foundation of your joy be that you are going to live forever in heaven and your name is written down by the uh, infinite scribe of the universe and he's not going to erase it. He wrote it down and you'll live forever that that should be the source of your joy. And it had become that for them. The Apostle Paul in his epistles references joy or rejoice more than 50 times. If there's one trait that should be evident in the lives of the church, it is joy. That we are happy and grateful and thankful and celebrating that our sins have been forgiven 
and we're going to go to heaven when we die. The second thing is the early church had learned the power of assembling together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. So this joy wasn't a singular joy, it was a corporate joy. Or it was both, actually. Each individual had joy, but that joy spilled out to others, and you celebrated together. Have you ever watched uh, your favorite athletic team and with somebody who also likes that team? And when something good happens, what do you first do? You turn to them. And you give each other a high five or whatever it is that you do, but you celebrate together. Joy looks for a companion. It looks for fellowship. It looks for an echo. And the power of assembling is us getting together and not just hearing somebody preach or hearing somebody sing, but engaging and responding to it with an echo from our heart. The power of assembling together because it energizes. And those of you who have been in meetings where there's an, an energy of being with other believers, you know it's a, it's a hard thing to, to um, um, identify, a hard thing to describe, but there's something powerful about corporate worship particularly uh, worship uh, singing, when a group of people sing together, where they set aside self-consciousness and they set aside their idea of where I don't sound good or I don't know the song that well, and they just decide I'm going to sing these words out with my heart and soul and everybody is singing loud, it's an amazing thing. Back in the days of the Promise Keepers, I went to one in uh, St. Petersburg and T.D. Jakes was a preacher that day. But uh, before he preached, it was all men. I think it was 30,000 men that were in the, uh, the stadium that day. The men sang, and they stopped the instrumentation. It was just the men singing. And I can't um, recall too many more powerful moments than that day when I heard 30,000 men singing as uh, full as they possibly could the name of Jesus. And it was so electric that when T.D. Jakes got up to preach, he only preached 15 minutes. And the altar was just full. But at one point in the sermon, he walked over here and he said, there's one name that should cause your heart to sing out. And he said, Jesus. And he went like that. And he said, say it. And they went, Jesus. And he went over here and he said, say it. And they went, Jesus. And he went to the middle and the place just went bananas. But it was men saying, we are excited about Jesus Christ. And it was that corporate energy that God designed us to interact with. If you're not involved in assembling together with other believers week after week, uh, you need to. Uh, you don't know what you're missing. The day that you skip might be the day where the Lord refreshes the assembly like never before, and you missed it because you were someplace else. Number three, the early church had learned to see opposition as opportunity. John and Peter had been arrested because they healed a lame man. The Bible says they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they let them go, and Peter and John came and told the assembled believers, and this is their response. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Now today, if we heard of a storm coming, of our rights being repressed, our cry out would be, God, stop the oppression. Stop the suppression. Their cry was, God, you've heard their threats. Give us boldness to preach your word. Because they had no guarantee their rights would be protected. We have some kind of guarantee. It's a piece of paper and it's flimsy. It's man-made. We, no, we have no way to know that's going to last. By the grace of God, it has. But what we do know is, even if our rights are stripped away, 
we can have the boldness and the power to speak the word of God. So they saw opposition as an opportunity to be faithful to God. The early church had learned to stay focused on their mission. Later on in Acts chapter 4, the multitude of those who believed after all this had happened were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They stayed focused throughout the book of Acts. That phrase pops up again and again. And they preached the resurrection. And they preached the Lord Jesus. And they preached the gospel. Wherever they went, they stayed focused on what the real mission was, which is to communicate the gospel. The early church had learned to expect persecution, not to dread it. In Acts chapter 5, the Bible says, When they had called the apostles, and beaten them, they commanded them <clears throat> that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And then daily, in the temple, and in every house, they did not cease to preach and teach Jesus as the Christ. They expected persecution, and when it came, that was game time. That was the start. That was when you, the rubber really hit the road. That was when it really mattered. So they expected it. We would be caught off guard today if it happened to us. In Acts chapter 13 in Iconium, the Bible says the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and they raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they expelled them from the region. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 14, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, now imagine this next phrase I'm about to give you. Imagine that being the slogan of a church. Here it comes. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, that wasn't saying you have to earn your salvation. He was saying, between now and us going to heaven, it's going to be a rough road to hoe. Not your best life now, not to ridicule anybody else, but that's not the message of the early disciples. It's get ready for trouble. That was what they exhorted. That's what the Bible says they encouraged them with. In other words, expect it. Don't be surprised by it. We must go through these tribulations before we enter the kingdom of God. The early church had learned the primacy of prayer and preaching. In Acts chapter 6, a conflict arose within the church because the, uh, the Greek Jews, the Hellenist Jews, their widows were not being uh, treated with the same care that the, uh, the Hebrew Jews were uh, culturally. And so there was an argument within the church. And so the church decided they needed to pray. So when it came time to divide up responsibilities, the conclusion was this by the disciples. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Prayer and the ministry of the word. You could summarize all the technologies and all the methodologies and all the strategies into two things. Prayer and the ministry of the word. It was true in the early church and it's true today. In Acts chapter 12, the Bible says Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, we read that, we just keep on going. Imagine if that happened today, that one of the leaders of this church was arrested and killed, executed. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter. When he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers 
to keep him. That means four soldiers in a patrol every uh, hour in a shift were watching him and chained to him. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. They had learned the first, the most powerful, the most effective response is prayer. Even when somebody's been killed and somebody's been arrested, pray. And the next, at the end of that chapter, the story ends with this. The word of God grew and multiplied. So then we come to Stephen, the very first martyr, where he is, he is stoned for his ministry and his faith. And that's when open persecution begins. And it says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere hiding. No. Went everywhere, keeping it quiet. Went everywhere using cloaked language. They went everywhere preaching the word. In other words, Saul comes in and literally takes people out of their houses, draws them into prison, and the response of the believers is as they scatter to keep telling the story, to keep preaching and teaching. In Acts chapter 11, the Bible says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word, but at first to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus. The early church had learned the primacy of prayer and preaching. Fellowship is important. Um, um, having outreach is important. Having um, opportunities to interact with each other in a lighthearted way is important. Concerts are important. But all those fall under one of two categories. Is it the preaching of the gospel or is it prayer based? All the fellowship, all the activity should in some way flow into one of those two. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That was true in James' day and it's true in 2016. Are we tapping into that um, potentiality, into that power? Are we a, a praying church? And then lastly, the early church had learned the power of praise and thanksgiving. Acts 16, 23 through 25. When they had laid many stripes on them, Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison. Now, this is not a prison in America. This is a Middle East prison in the first century. Imagine the worst prison you can imagine in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and then knock it back 2,000 years, and you're in the very deepest part of that prison. And they fastened their feet in stocks. So they couldn't stand up. They couldn't walk around. They couldn't stretch. They had been beaten. And now their feet are in stocks, and they're in some dungy, stinky, hot, sweaty, suffocating inner dungeon. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, no one is there to witness this. There's no one there to make a, a report to the media to say, and this amazing thing happened when these two guys were arrested. They sang at midnight. This is simply in their hearts to do. They had learned way back at the first point of the message, they had learned the true foundation of joy, which is not not having your feet in stocks. It is not not being in prison. The, the, the foundation of joy is not ever being beaten. The foundation of joy is having your name written down in heaven. So when you've been beaten and you're sitting in a dungeon and your feet are in stocks, your name is still in heaven. That's why the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? If God has your name there, what could possibly happen here that can alter that? The early church knew that, they believed that, and they were looking for things above, not on things on this earth. They were seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
not their own profit and their own comfort and their own ease. We're looking at the persistence or the resilience or the perseverance or the tenacity of the early church. So that would be an example to us to persevere, to have the right foundation laid that when trouble comes, we know how to respond. We throw our shoulders back and bow our heads in prayer and then look up to serve God faithfully with joy. No matter what any of you might be going through today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Paul would say to you that he reckons that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. The treasure of a believer is there. It's not here. Because you don't have treasures here does not mean you're not favored of God. Because you have treasures here does not mean you are favored of God. Having treasures up there means you're favored of God. Nothing on earth could possibly compare to living forever in heaven with other believers and the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly because you don't deserve it. It was given to you. And he chose you out of a dark and sinister crowd and pulled you out and said, here, this is yours forever. That's the joy. That's the resilience of the early church. In good times or in bad, we celebrate that we belong to the Lord Jesus. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Acts and all the vivid portrayals of opposition, persecution, confusion, and yet the opportunity of this new fledgling group of believers to go into a hostile pagan world in which their message was outlawed, yet still proclaim boldly the gospel and not to water it down, not to make it culturally acceptable, but to preach it as you gave it. Father, may we follow that example. And, and then, Father, this morning, I know there has to be at least one believer here in our assembly who who needs to be strengthened by you for the road ahead. They need to have the strength to persevere. Every one of us, if we are to persevere, we need you to do it for us. But there could be some who, particularly this week, they've just been through something, or they're about to go through something. Well, they will need to look up to you and draw their strength from you. Father, I pray that this message today will sink into our hearts that it, it'll come to our minds at the forefront that when trouble comes we lift our voice in praise to you we pray to you and we strive to be faithful to you now this incredible promise and power and perseverance is available only to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as you're praying let me ask you first of all have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you responded to the gospel, this offer of salvation that is yours to embrace? Have you responded? If not, I implore you, do so today. Put away every doubt, every skepticism, every hesitance. Put it away and step across that line and say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you are a believer and you know you're in need of some stamina, that your spiritual strength often turns into complaining and despair, that you need to have spiritual stamina, ask him to begin that work in you. And I would say, I would assume that each one of us need that work. Our Heavenly Father, may you work in the heart and minds of each person who is here this morning and all those who are watching on live stream or who may watch later on in the week. May your spirit convict us. May your spirit conform us. And may your spirit endow us with the, the character and the virtue and the faith of our Lord and Savior, who is our example. May we run the race. May we finish the course. May we keep the faith. For we ask that in Jesus' name.
I'd like to ask if each one of you stay just for about five more minutes. We have um, something we need to address, and it's a chance for the church to be the church. Last week we mentioned to you about some uh, issues with our credit card and some fraudulent charges. And as a follow-up to that, we have um, some statements to be made by some members of our church, and then